For all of you out there in Twitter land that think he or she is extremely smart, check out HMOpedia to see how you compare with the geniuses. These geniuses, referred to here by Kevin Edward, are the top 1,000 geniuses of all time ranked in a descending order of intelligence or intellectual brightness. In this video we're going to take a look at the top 100 geniuses whose IQs are ranked between 180 and 230. At number 100 we have Anton Lavoisier who in 1926 was ranked by Catherine Cox in her famous ranking of 300 geniuses with an IQ of 170. He is the chemist chemist, who marks the start of modern chemistry with his caloric theory of heat, ranking of the elements, and experiments such as his solar furnace shown here where he's using sunlight to burn things and study the nature of heat on the elements. He was famously guillotined during the French Revolution. Lagrange put things like this. It took them only an instant to cut off that head, but it is unlikely that a hundred years will suffice to reproduce a similar one. At number 99 we have Charles Sherrington, the famous English physiologist who in his very erudite 1938 Man on His Nature lecture explained building on the work of Jean Fernel, who rips apart Aristotle's theories of heat and life, that from the modern point of view you cannot say any longer that you can explain life in terms of physics and chemistry, or that life is an anthropomorphism or anthropism as Sherrington put things. The modern genius is well aware of this and now knows as a matter of fact that a person is not alive, things can only move, exist, and react. At number 98 we have Thales of Miletus, the famous Greek philosopher, in fact, the patriarch of all Greek philosophy, who initiated the travel to Egypt and the study of their knowledge coming back with the idea that there are three principles or things to the universe. First is water, out of which earth, and then fire spring. At number 97 we have Plato, who in 1996 was estimated by Tony Buzan in his ranking of the top 100 geniuses in his opinion with an IQ of 180. He has a ranker greatest mind ranking of 5 out of the top 1300 minds of all time, which has been voted on by 40,000 people. In 1996, James Cattle, in his ranking of the top 1,000 individuals by citation and discussion prominence among six multi-language dictionaries and encyclopedias, he is ranked 10th. A thought experiment he is best known for is Plato's clave, wherein he reasons that in many cases we are but people sitting on a stage looking at puppet shows on a wall that we think is reality when in fact this is just shadows created by a puppeteer from behind us, whereas in reality truth can only be found by ascent to sunlight. At number 96 we have Johannes Kepler, gauged by Catherine Cox with an IQ of 175, the rank of greatest mind ranking of 18. He is known for the pre-Newtonian formulation of the laws of planetary motion. On the plus side, he was a cohort of Galileo. In one of the letters Galileo wrote to him saying, so large is the number of fools. He was a fabled last person to know everything. On the downside, Kepler, being religious, believed that planets were moved around in their orbits being pushed by angels flapping their wings. At 95 we have Werner Heisenberg, 
known for his work on the exchange force of atomic bonding and more famous for his uncertainty principle wherein he reasoned that because to know the position of a thing one must shine light on it the light itself perturbs the motion of the thing being measured and therefore there is an uncertainty in all measurement. At 94 we have William Rankin, one of the co-founders of thermodynamics known for his thermodynamic function the precursor to what we now know as entropy or heat divided by temperature. Lesser known is his 1874 poem The Mathematician in Love where he states that love can be explained mathematically and that it is a function or a kind of potential. At 93 we have Greek atomic theorist Lucretius who famously took 300 scrolls of his master Epicurus and wrote the now famous book On the Nature of Things where he described that all is atoms moving in a void, a book that has been read by nearly every genus since. Thomas Jefferson, for example, kept over seven copies of Lucretius' work. In 92 we have Pythagoras, commonly known for his Pythagorean theorem, a greatest mathematician ever ranking of 11. In Aristotle's collected works he is ranked as the sixth most discussed person. Pythagoras famously believed in the concept of transmigration of souls in that when a person ceases to exist their soul, in Egyptian speak, moves to another creature. The soul, as we will discuss, is one of the last citadels to conquer in the land of future genuses. At 91, we move into the IQ 185 plus range, and we find Paolo Sharpie, a noted early famous atheist who was ranked by Catherine Cox with a curious IQ of 195 based on his intellectual achievements and also ranked by Herbert Wahlberg in 1981 with an IQ of 187. He published a description of the universe that left no room for God or anything supernatural, argued that intelligent people can see past the myths of religion and have normal existences without recourse to fear of God or death. At number 90 we have Hugo Grotius, ranked by Cox with an IQ of 200, by Wahlberg with an IQ of 197. He had a theory of the origin of war supposedly that was similar to Thomas Hobbes. He believed that in relations between nations there were natural laws which needed only research and reason to discover their principles of operation. At 89 we have George Berkeley, noted for his 1713 moral attraction theory. He outlined also a social gravitation-like theory. He was later derogated by Petrum Sorokin, the first founder of the sociology department at Harvard, who attacked all sorts of positivism, but he was defended by Bernard Cohen. At number 88 we have Oliver Heaviside. He is the person who was so infatuated by James Maxwell that he took Maxwell's equations, who if you don't know, describe the nature of light in terms of electromagnetic waves characterized by Boltzmann as being written by the hand of God and reduce them down to 20 variables with just two equations and in two variables. At 87 we have Ettore Majorana who was ranked by Fermi, the last universal physicist, 
as being akin and genius to Galileo and Newton. In less than 32 years of age, he founded or initiated the exchange force theory of chemical bonding, similar to Heisenberg, and also published on human quantum mechanics and codependently discovered the neutron and took his own existence in 1938. At number 86 we have William Gilbert, the father of magnetism, by way of his numerous magnetic experiments in his 1600 De Magente, wherein he rejected Aristotle's natural philosophy, Galen's medicine, and Ptolemy's astronomy in its place situated an electricity magnetism based Copernican cosmology. He's the originator of the famous floating magnet experiment, which was used in the elucidation of the structure of the atom at the turn of the 20th century. At 85, we have Immanuel Kant, cited by Cox with an IQ of 175. He's a fabled last person to know everything, rank of greatest mind ranking of 20. He was one of the first persons to initiate the nebular hypothesis, namely that the sun, the earth, and the solar system resulted from a gravitational-like circular attraction of nebular gas. He also worked on the Abraham Brahma problem in 1869, which for those who don't know, means that Abraham and Brahma are both character rewrites of the Egyptian sun god Ra. At 84 we have Sat Yendra Bose, who is the eponym of the boson, which is the name of the force portion of the particles of the universe. He has a IQ comparison to another person ranking of 187. And in 1925, he predicted with Einstein Bose-Einstein condensate, which was confirmed in 1995. Also, he is known for his Bose-Einstein statistics, which every boson, such as light or photons, obey. At 83, we have Frederick Rossini. He is a relatively unknown genius, colloquially speaking, but he is a top social Newton, number 7 out of 55, for his 1971 chemical thermodynamics in the real world, wherein he stated, using chemical thermodynamic logic, that the paradox between freedom and security in society, for example, as shown here, the freedom that Americans want in being able to go out and do what they want versus the security or over-security of having cameras and security checks at every airport and street. One has to find a balance in this conflict of interest. Rosini stated that this can be found in the balance between enthalpy and entropy and the reaction equilibrium constants that this brings about when applied to social reactions. A downside is that he believed in a creator and that the creator has fashioned the laws of thermodynamics. They're deeply seated and broadly applicable to our social interactions. At number 82 we have Niels Bohr, famously known for his 1913 Bohr model, the atom, when he proposed that in the atom electrons are confined to shells as shown here, and that for an electron to jump to an outer shell, energy equal to Planck's constant times speed of light divided by the wavelength of the light has to be embedded or put into the atom in order for the electron to jump up. Conversely, for an electron to go down in orbital structure and energy equal to 
Planck's constant times the speed of light divided by the wavelength has to be emitted from the atom. At number 81 we have Alexander Humboldt. He is famously known as one of the fabled last persons to know everything. He is a top 100 cattle 1000. He was one of the first persons to propose that South America and Africa were both previously joined. At number 80 we're getting into the big leagues with Thomas Hobbes, one of the first thing philosophers. That is, someone who views all entities in the universe as things, humans included, and the movement of things as motion. In his 1651 Leviathan, he opens to the following very sharp statement. That when a thing lies still, unless someone else stir it, it will lie still forever, is a truth that no man doubts. But that when a thing is in motion, it will internally be in motion, unless somewhat else stay it. Though the reason be the same, namely that no thing can change itself. This right here is the disproof of free will, and that a thing that moves itself is a violation of the principle of inertia. He continues, is not so easily assented to. For men measure not only other men, but all other things by themselves, and because they find themselves subject after motion to pain and lassitude, think everything else grows weary of motion and seeks repose of its own accord, little considering whether it be not some other motion wherein that desire of rest they find in themselves consistent. Hobbes draws analogies between the laws of mechanics and features of society, indirectly advocating atheism, and he is the main initiator of the field of human physics, and later became very influential to Benedict Spinoza in his model of the natural right of things, in his theological political philosophy. Hobbes was also one of the first to debunk the view that Moses was the author of the Pentateuch, or the first five books of the Bible, a view that many commonly believe presently. We now know, based on the work of over 200 religion and mythology scholars, that Moses was not a real person, but rather a god to prophet rescript of the Greco-Romanian god Dionysus Bacchus, based on the fact that the 24 main things or characteristics known about Moses are already found in the god Bacchus. For example, that they both fetched water out of a rock. They both parted the seas with a thrysis or pine cone topped staff. They both had ray-like horns or, as Voltaire pointed out in 1769, that they both engraved their laws on two stone tablets. At number 79, we have Emanuel Swedenborg, ranked by Catherine Cox with an IQ of 165, ranked by other means with an IQ of 205, and in the 1960s, he was, he was ranked in Guinness Book with an IQ of 210. He's a top 90 cattle 1000. He's famous for his nebular hypothesis. Work done prior to Kant. He did work on atomic theory. He gets a downgrade for a plethora of God talk quotes and assertions about angels. At number 78, we have Alfred Latka, who is a known as a part-time genius, but whose concepts found in his 1925 Principles of Physical Biology are very forward-thinking and way ahead of their time. He outlines what's called physical chemical monism, and that he states, for example, one of many examples discussed, that the straining of soap contracting operates according to the same physical chemical principles as when an amoeba strains to engulf a food particle, just as when a Newton strains in thinking to solve a problem, and that these are all atomic geometries 
moving according to one set of principles. At number 77, we have August Comte, who in his 1835 Positive Philosophy stated that, Since we have now grasped celestial and terrestrial mechanics, mechanical and chemical and organic physics, both vegetable and animal, there remains but one science to fill up, namely social physics, which is the principal aim of the present work established. He states that, what sociology needs is a Galileo-Newton type upgrade description. This is something still far ahead of its time in that, for example, presently, sociophysics is not recognized as an actual science by the American Academy of Sciences, nor is it taught at but maybe two or three universities in the world presently. At number 76, we have Frederick Schilling, ranked by Cox with an IQ of 190. He has a ranker greatest mine ranking of 120, cattle 1000 ranking of 154, and his 1795 natural philosophy theory was very influential to Goethe and his 1796 chemical philosophy theory. The two were conducting optical experiments in 1798, the year prior to when Goethe had been conducting magnetic experiments after reading his ideas towards a philosophy of nature in attempts to find a unified theory of everything. At number 75 we have Marie Curie, the first female on the list. She is a double Nobel Prize winner for her work on the discovery of radioactivity in 1903 and also for her work on the isolation of pure radium. At 74, we have Sigmund Freud, who, in his 1895, A Project for Scientific Psychology, stated that we could take free energy, otherwise known as Gibbs free energy, and bound energy, otherwise known as the entropic energy, and formulate a scientific psychology. This is something that is still presently at least two centuries ahead of its time. At number 73, we have Jean D. Albert, known for D. Albert's principle. He was the PhD advisor to Laplace, and he was one of the first physics advisors to the French Encyclopedia, co written with Denis Diderot. And the two minds conjoined, Diderot and D. Albert, are said to end an era in which a single human being was able to comprehend the totality of knowledge. At 72 we have John Mill, ranked by Buzan with an IQ of 185, Cox with an IQ of 180, others but with an IQ of 200, fabled the last person to know everything. He was curiously a split-brainer who could read or write two different languages simultaneously, one in each hand. He was trained as a youth by Jeremy Bentham and went on to promote a secular utilitarianism view of morality. At number 71, we have English Egyptologist Gerald Macy, who is the main scholar behind recent viral films such as Zeitgeist or Religious, wherein truths are asserted, for example, that Jesus is based on Horus, that Lazarus in the Bible is based on Osiris, that the Virgin Mary is based on Isis, or that John the Baptist is a rescript of the Egyptian god Anubis. Among the 220 plus religion and mythology scholars, Macy is a staple thinker in that if you want to know, for example, whether Abraham was a real person, you're going to check and see what Macy had to say about this first. At number 70, we have Humphrey Davy. He is a genius's genius in that. He's famous for the 1799 ice rubbing experiments wherein he went into a room 
lower than the freezing point of water and rubbed ice together to see if they could melt to disprove Lavoisier's caloric theory. This was one of the first mechanical theory of heat experiments, in other words, the prototypes to the first law of thermodynamics. In 1802, he also invented the arc lamp, which was the forerunner to the light bulb invented by Edison in 1878. Frederick Schiller, number 69, IQ 185. Cox, we see, was way off in our estimate of his IQ. He currently has a ranker greatest mine position of 87, was 75th in the Cattle 1000. He is generally known for his 1795 drive theory poem, The World Ways, where he asserts that the world turns, similar to a graining mill being turned by falling water by love and hunger, which, for example, is used by Freud in his later drive theory of sex and death. In genius circles, he is best known as being the intellectual confidant of Goethe, who with, from 1796 to 1803, he developed his human chemical theory, namely that, according to Goethe, people react together like chemicals and the passions are governed by the driving forces of chemical affinity. Goethe famously commented to Schiller on the writing of Prosper Crabion in 1799, the passions are not like playing cards, that one can shuffle, play, reshuffle, and play again without their changing at all. Passions are governed by the delicate chemical affinities through which they attract and repel each other, reunite, neutralize each other, separate again and recover. Now, if there's one sentence that all children should be taught in their 25 years of education is that the passions are not like playing cards. An assertion made or alluded to by Prosper Krabilan correctly, passions are governed by chemical affinities and the chemical affinities which are the micro forces of interaction, are governed by the free energy change of the system, which Freud, as we discussed, touched on in his 1895 treatise on scientific psychology. This statement is so far ahead of its time that it's not taught in any universities, give or take a few teachings of this at the University of Paderborn in Germany, but will be a subject that's taught predominantly and increasingly in the centuries to come. At number 68, we have Alan Turing, who has a ranker greatest mind position of 33, which is very high considering the recentness of his genius. He's a Stokes 100 essential thinker, ranking 96. He's a Glenn top 20 scientific mind. His 1936 paper on computable numbers with an application to the decision problem launched computer science. In World War II, he built a machine called the bomb shown adjacent that famously cracked the Enigma code, allowing German naval communications to be read, which is said to have shortened the war by two years, as famously portrayed in the 2014 film The Enigma Game. He famously debound stated, that is, took his own life by way of eating a cyanide-laced apple per a result of his homosexuality persecutions and is symbolic of the conflict between religion and science. Next we have Hero of Alexandria. He is a top 10 greatest engineer ever. He's ranked 36 in Ellis's top 100 mathematicians ranking. In his 50 AD Pneumatica, he overthrows the physics of Strato and Cetivius and outlines an atomic theory in which matter consists of particles mixed with distributed vacua and in which he describes an aleopile or heat engine and openly challenged the nature of horrors a vacuum dictum and among other things was one of the first supposedly to have discovered imaginary numbers. He also built a famous number of automata such as shown here 
whose movement actuated according to falling weights, steam or pressure hydraulics, the forerunner to modern robots, and one of the precursors to Descartes' later famous quip, I think, therefore I am. At 66 we have Desideris Erasmus, who is ranked according to what's called the Cox Buzan IQ, that is, the geniuses common to both the 1926 Cox rankings of 300 geniuses and the 100 geniuses but done by Tony Buzan in 1996 at position number 9 with an IQ of 178. He was one of the few famous people to ever famously declare that nothing is more beautiful than to know all. He also is the person behind the saying that when I get a little money I buy books and if there is any left over I buy food. At 65 we have Percy Shelley. He is a posthumous genius and that his work is only coming into light in that as a youth he studied chemistry at the age of 10 and discovered that there are more than four elements and that the chemical affinities are what govern the reactions between elements and also the reactions between humans. He famously was kicked out of Oxford for his atheism explicit human chemical affinity theory with which he used according to Mary Shelley the author of Frankenstein to marry her in the so-called church of elective affinities this is the first ever atheistic religion so to say at 64 we have Arthur Schopenhauer who after being tutored by Goethe as a youth, he went on to write his two-volume The World as Will and Representation, wherein he showed that people, just as chemicals, or the so-called will of the copper, is governed by one principle, and that a person can do what they will in the world, but they cannot will what they will. He was Germany's first out and open atheist and his work became the mental backbone to Nietzsche. At 63 we have Otto Gurek who after the 30 year war in Germany sought out to prove the dictum that nature abhors a vacuum and decided or attempt to make a vacuum. He is described as a neglected genius in that in his many vacuum experiments such as shown here where a bulb or vacuum bulb evacuates the air out of a piston he's able to show that the power of a vacuum has as much strength as 20 men. From this experiment not only was the steam engine invented but also so was phenomena such as Boyle's law that pressure is inversely proportional to volume. At number 62 we have Norman Doloff who is a relatively unknown genius outside of thermodynamic circles who presently is a top five social Newton and in his 1975 book he becomes the first person to attempt to quantify all things according to an entropy of formation. And what he does that is genius is that he's the first person to show an organism synthesis equation. In other words, a gecko comprised of about 20 elements or a human comprised of 26 elements is formed through a chemical synthesis reaction wherein n number of elements react over so many years to form an organism. 
and this reaction has a Gibbs free energy of reaction formation and also an entropy change associated with it. So whereas most people presently and before this publication like to quip that the paradox between the second law of thermodynamics and evolution is resolved such that the decrease in entropy associated with the gecko or human is more than compensated by the increase in disorder outside of the system. This is all elementary logic compared to what Dolov is doing here and that he is the transition mind into switching from instead of just the focus on entropy that it is the focus on Gibbs free energy which is or has entropy in its function that is the key ingredient to focus on in a general theory of everything. He did this all in an explicit atheism framework. At number 61 we have Robert Boyle famous for his bird in a vacuum experiment which he did to disprove Thomas Hobbes assertion that cold was the result of wind and also noted for his experiments on the power of the cold done in 1665 when he showed that if water was put in a wine bottle it would take 72 pounds of weight put on top of the cork overnight to keep the cork from popping out. This is one of the, the first mechanical equivalent of heat experiments. At 60 we have Nicholas Copernicus famous for asserting that it is the earth that revolves around the sun not the sun that revolves around the earth. In his 1543 on the revolutions of the heavenly orbs he is said to started the scientific revolution. At 59 we have Euclid famous for his book The Elements which has been read by nearly every genius since. Einstein for example at age 12 was given a text of Euclidean geometry after which he would go on to call it the Holy Geometry Book. Next we have Thomas Edison ranked by Tony Buzan as having an IQ of 195. He is what we might call a pop genius in that he has a ranker greatest mind position of 31 known commonly for his inventions such as the light bulb, the phonograph record, and the motion picture camera. He is also a deep thinker. In 1909, at the passing of William James, he was interviewed by New York Times and asked about his views on religion and science. To quote one statement, he said, My mind is incapable of conceiving such a thing as a soul. It may be an error, and man may have a soul, but I simply do not believe it. This is an example of an area where people are ignorant about certain aspects of nature, which perpetuates the belief in the soul, even though such a thing does not exist. At 57 we have Baron de Holbach who after inheriting a large sum of money from his father founded the French tradition of intellectual salons where he would invite people to his mansion such as Voltaire, David Hume, Adam Smith, Benjamin Franklin and discussed all the great problems of philosophy. He famously published the system of nature, otherwise known as one of the top atheist Bibles of all time, and is characterized as the Newton of the atheists. His treatise has been described 
is one of the most exhaustive discussions of atheism from a scientific, philosophical, moral, and political perspective ever written. To quote one sentence, which was cited by Percy Shelley's 1811, The Necessity of Atheism, he states, If ignorance of nature gave birth to such a variety of gods, the knowledge of this nature is calculated to destroy them. In other words, the study of nature is the only tool by which we will dissolve belief in the gods. And this is an ongoing task of the future genius. At 57, we have Christian Hugens, who is a top genius's genius, having done a number of things. He was the mathematical mentor to Gottfried Leibniz. He did Lyesian work on vacuum theory of Otto Gurek. He also invented the gunpowder engine, and with his associate Dennis Papin, he did work that resulted in the determination of the quantity mv squared, later called vis viva by Leibniz, which remains constant during perfectly elastic collisions. He also is famously known for his wave theory of light. At 55 we have the famed child prodigy turned super 19th century genius William Thompson, known for the absolute temperature, an early founder of thermodynamics. He is best known for having scoured France for Sadi Carnot's thermodynamics memoir on the motive power of fire, which he used and brought to the attention of the world, therein seeding the foundation of modern thermodynamics. He gets a downgrade for defending the Bible up until his last years. For example, calculating a religious biased age of the sun, among other things. At 54 we have Percy Bridgman, known for the Bridgman equations, 800 equations concisely formulated of thermodynamics. The Bridgman paradox, which states that to calculate the entropy of a existive thing such as a gecko or a human, one would have to destroy the thing and therein it is paradoxically impossible to calculate the entropy of a human. He was also one of the cohorts of John Q. Stewart's 1939 to 1954 Princeton Department of Social Physics, which was funded by the Rockefeller Foundation. At 53, we have Benedict Spinoza, who is posthumously published treatise Ethics, attempted to define what is moral in terms of a logic based on Euclidean geometry. He, or his view that nature equals God, has been cited and absorbed by nearly every genus since, from or all the way up to the time of Einstein. At 52 we have Epicurus, the central thinker behind Greek atomic theory. When his ideas on atoms were revived by Pierre Gassandé, it is said that this was one of the seeds alongside Copernicus that started the intellectual scientific revolution. His views are so powerful that Thomas Jefferson in the 1820s when asked whether he believed in Christianity stated that he was an Epicurean materialist. Next we have Pierre Maupertuis who after being mentored by Johann Bernoulli developed his principle of least action based on Newton's first law of motion which precursored the Lagrangian which precursored itself the Hamiltonian which precursored the Gibbsian which as we've been discussing is the new reformulation for belief in God. Helmholtz, the now 
ranked last of the last universal geniuses, attempt to reconcile his principle of least action with the conservation of force. Mao Puitas also discussed the physics of the soul via atomic theory, and he did battle with many big geniuses such as Voltaire and Diderot. His Venus physics often brings comparison to Goethe's elective affinities. He is difficult to rank. At number 50, capping off the 185 category, we have Richard Feynman, who is a pop genius, famous for the formulation of quantum electrodynamics, or the physics behind the interactions of electrons and light and for his development of Feynman diagrams. He is known for his quick mind. For example, he had a standing bet that he could solve any problem to within 10% in 60 seconds. Moving into the IQ 190 plus range, we have first on our list, Blasi Pascal, who at the age of 19 made a counting machine similar to a calculator made of toothed wheels and gears, moving drums and carrying numbers that could add, subtract, and multiply and divide. He built 50 of these in total and they impressed Descartes. In 1646 he repeated Torricelli's vacuum experiments and over the next decade he spent all of his time on mathematics and gambling. His name is in pop culture for the so-called Pascal's Wager after he had a brush with death at the age of 31. He used probability theory to argue or prove to himself whether or not it is fortuitous to believe in God. He reasoned that it was better to believe in God and that one would win in the long run, probability speaking. Correctly, we know this is wrong and that if you believe in God, you're also anchored to the rules of action associated with that belief. Whereas if you anchor your rules of action in a modern morality system, such as Epicurean materialism or Gertian physical chemistry, then one's actions will be more in align with the laws of the universe and therefore one will be a more natural thing. At 48, we have Max Planck, famous not only for his work in thermodynamics, but most famous for being the founder of quantum mechanics by way of his solution to the ultraviolet catastrophe problem, wherein he used or started with a conjecture by Ludwig Boltzmann that the energy or entropy of systems could be quantified into states and extrapolated on this to the effect that energy itself could be quantized or broken into quantums. At 47 we have William Shakespeare ranked in an overestimation manner by Tony Buzan with an IQ of 210. He is a greatest literary author ever, number one. Cattle 1000 top 10. He's one of Nietzsche's Ubermen or minds that will eventually replace God. He is very high in what we might call emotional IQ. At 46 we have Wilhelm Oswald, one of the founders of modern physical chemistry. He was involved in the energetics debate with Boltzmann on whether everything is based on energy or conversely Everything is based, as Boltzmann asserted, on thermodynamics and atoms. Oswald eventually lost the debate, but he 
recanted in the end and sided with Boltzmann. In his autobiography, he stated, I am made from the same schnapps combination, that is, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, sulfur, phosphorus, from which a Bunsen, Hemmoltz, and Kirchhoff came. This is a foundation statement of what is called radical atheism, or the word associated with Oswald. He is similar to the mindset of the modern Carl Sagan who stated, I'm a collection of water, calcium, and organic molecules called Carl Sagan. You are a collection of almost identical molecules with a different collective label. At 45, we have Athanasius Kircher, one of the fabled last persons to know everything. He did research on optics, hieroglyphics, and a number of other subjects. He coined the term electromagnetism and one of the first formulators of a magnetic cosmological theory of everything. At 44 we have Henry Poincaré, known for the Poincaré conjecture, relativity, thermodynamics, mathematics, and is often cited as one of the last universal geniuses. At 43 we have Thomas Jefferson, ranked by Buzan with an IQ of 195, he is a fabled last persons to know everything and walking encyclopedia. He had a home library of close to 7,000 books. He was a thing philosopher and also an unlearned expositor, which means that one has to forcibly unlearn many of the things they were taught in youth if they are to become a free-minded thinker. He is also the author of the American Declaration of Independence. His view is that all religions are alike, founded upon fables and mythologies. He is a top religio-mythology scholar. At 42 we have Greek philosopher Hypatia, one of the only known universal female geniuses. Because most of her work is only found in fragments, much of what is known about her is speculative but promising, and that she is rumored to have explained the seasonal variations of the apparent size of the sun. She conceived of elliptical orbit helocentrism years before Kepler formulated this. At 41, we have Emily Chatelet who currently is the number one ranked smartest woman ever. She is best known for her work in the combination of Newton's definition of energy equals mv with Leibniz's definition of energy equals mv squared with Wilhelm Gravesand's brass box clay experiments, which she used to synthesize the first version of the conservation of energy or transformation of vis viva into vis mortua or kinetic energy transforming into potential energy. She also was the mistress of Voltaire in her spare time and had an immense library comparable to the Paris Academy of Science and she ran the biggest research lab in France. At 40 we have John Strutt who is most famous as being the solver of the 2,000 year old problem of why the sky is blue, worked on by nearly every genus prior to him. At 39 we have Archimedes, ranked by Buzan with an IQ of 190, ranked by John Platt with an IQ of 190. He is known for hydrostatics, statistics, 
the explanation of the principle of the lever, and he's a fabled last person to know everything. At 38, we have Ludwig Butchner, whose 1855 Force and Matter, which was read by Einstein at age 13, is a top-ranked atheist Bible, number one out of five. His view is that man reacts with woman like hydrogen reacts with oxygen. He is a Gertian materialist. At 37, we have Empedocles, who we might define as the first true physicist. He's the third most cited person in Aristotle's collected works. And he's the person behind the view that all things in the universe are made from two forces, or attraction and repulsion, and four elements, namely earth, air, water, and fire. He is the person behind the idiom that people react or mix like oil and water if they're enemies, and if they're friends, they mix like water and wine. This is the first precursory statement to human chemical theory. At 36, we have Leon Winiarski, who is a relatively unknown genius. His work, as of yet, has not yet been translated from French into English, but in his 1898 essay on social mechanics, he attempts to base sociology on the Clausius inequality, or the circle integral of heat elements added to or taken out of a system or social system at the absolute temperature of the surface of the social system equals zero in a reversible social system. This is something that's not taught in any sociology class presently and likely won't be taught for many decades to come, but is something far ahead of its time. He is social newton number four presently. At 35, we have Paul Dirac, who as a youth or a young man started with Einstein's relativity theory and applied it to the motion of the electron in the atom and therefrom predicted the antiparticle. It is said that the work of Paul Feynman was but a cleanup of what Derek had already done. At 34, we have Giordano Bruno, who was famously burned at the stake for refusing to recant his belief in atoms and a universe made of multiple solar systems. At 33, we have Pierre Gassandi, who revived the atomic theory work of Epicurus by writing a set of books outlining his philosophical implications of atomic theory, which was supposedly written to counter the philosophical views of Descartes. He was the first to coin the term molecule, which he described as fitted together atoms. And he gave one of the first chemical creation models, which is that atoms react to form molecules, which react to form small structures similar to molecules, which is a precursor to evolution. At 32, we have Enrico Fermi, who is generally known as the last universal physicist. That is, by 1954, he was the last physicist to know all of physics. At 31, we have Frederick Nietzsche, whose name goes without saying, who is currently at position 26 in the ranker greatest mind ranking of the top 1,300 minds of all time. After declaring that God is dead in 1882 and postulating in 1883 that a future Uberman would arise that would replace belief in God, he assembled his fragmentary notes on a theory called will to power, the last of which is the famous will to power fragment 
1067, wherein he states his final views on things. Do you know what the world is to me? I shall show you in my mirror. This world is a monster of energy without beginning, without end, a firm iron magnitude of force that does not grow bigger or smaller, that does not expend itself, but only transforms itself. This is my Dionysian world of the eternally self-creating and eternally self-destroying. Dionysian, as we've touched on previously, or rather the Dionysus Bacchus god coupling was the precursor to the character of Moses. And Dionysus itself is the Greek reformulation of the Egyptian god Osiris. And this formed the principles of the Old Testament. The New Testament, in turn, came from the Roman reformulation of the Osiris Horus god coupling, which went into the character of Jesus. So Nietzsche, whose father was a preacher, aimed to destroy the Bible and replace it with belief in energy, force, and power. And in his last fragments, he grappled with this in terms of the first and second law of thermodynamics. And he saw that the future world would be replaced with, instead of believing in good and evil, we would have a morality, purpose, and meaning system that went beyond good and evil, which in modern terms means that good is defined via energy, force, and power in terms of acts or processes that are exergonic or Gibbs free energy releasing, and evil is defined as acts or processes that are endergonic, that is Gibbs free energy absorbing. This again is something that is at least a century or two ahead of its times, which is why Nietzsche is ranked as one of the top posthumous geniuses. At number 30 we have Francis Bacon, a classical geniuses genius, in that he famously was the one who stated knowledge is power in physics. He was the, one of the first to state that heat itself, its essence and quiddity is motion and nothing else. He's the curator of the scientific method. He was one of the first to do battle with Aristotle's and his final cause logic of movement and is a commentator on atheism. At 29 we have American genius Linus Pauling, who, doing things such as starting up his own chemical company at the age of 15, went on to study under Arnold Summerfield, Niels Bohr, and Hermann Schrodinger, and from this education started with the 1917 then taught in American universities view that atoms were held together by hooks and eyes to the post Linus Pauling view that atoms are held together by electron orbital overlap. And his 1938 The Nature of the Chemical Bond is now referred to as the Bible of Modern Chemistry. Pauling also gets upgrades for, in 1989, ripping apart Erwin Schrodinger's famous idiom that life feeds on negative entropy. Pauling, being a keen chemical engineer stated that Schrodinger's idea of life defined as something that feeds on negative entropy is about as silly as a, defining life as a cat lapping up milk. At 28 we have John von Neumann who famously is what we might call a frog lily pad hopping genius in that he hopped around from problem to problem, but he can never stay put with one, but nevertheless made significant breakthroughs in a number of areas. For example, he is one of the early pioneers of the computer. He, in 1934, did some of the first work in economic thermodynamics, wherein he discussed how free energy could be 
defined in terms of cash value in an economic sense. He struggled with the automaton problem in terms of chemical components floating on the lake and what this would mean in terms of them being able to self-assembly into a human-like automaton. He did work on quantum mechanics. A downgrade is that he kept the deeper problems of religion versus science out of his head until his last years. And he famously went begging to a priest for them to administer Pascal's wager to him so that he wouldn't die not believing in God. At 27, we have Erwin Schrodinger, famous for his 1926 Schrodinger equation, wherein he solved the energy state of an atom in terms of its summation of the kinetic and potential energy of the wave mechanics of the electron and is the capstone to modern quantum mechanics. He is colloquially known for his 1943 What is Life lecture, wherein he not only stimulated the later discovery of DNA, but also posed it as discussed that life is defined by what feeds on negative entropy. And this is a puzzle that takes at least five to ten years to solve. After he gave his What is Life lecture, Schrodinger was famously attacked by his colleagues, after which he had to pen his infamous note to chapter 6, wherein he stated that had he been catering to a rigorous hard science audience, he would have turned the discussion to free energy, that is, Gibbs free energy, as we have been discussing in this genius ranking countdown. Correctly, life does not exist, and what we traditionally considered to be life is but bound state structures of carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur, plus 20 or so other elements, depending on the entity, that move about for a determined period or state of existence, each of which is brought into existence by a Gibbs free energy based synthesis equation. As Norman Doloff touched on in his 1975 book, He, Death, and the Phoenix. At 26, we have French engineer Sadi Carnot, who in his, as discussed, motive power of fire, studied all the different steam engines of his day and formulated a universal theory of heat, which has been described as having a core of abstraction comparable to the best of Galileo. This is the seed book that initiated thermodynamics. At 25 we have Gene Sales, who in his 1775 The Philosophy of Moral Nature went on to pose it that there exists a great principle of the human body which comes from a great process in which so many millions of atoms of the earth became so many millions of human molecules. He was a cohort of Voltaire and for example in his discussions of morality famously used the thought experiment of Isaac Newton sitting on the shores of Africa calculating the tides when he overhears an African, a merman and an oyster discussing the morality of eating and who has the best morals. At 24 we have Joseph Lagrange, famous for the 1788 Lagrangian or formulation of the total energy of force function quantification of a system. This work in turn was absorbed by William Hamilton who formed the Hamiltonian formulation the dynamics of systems, which was absorbed by, as we'll discuss, Rudolf Clausius, who formulated the so-called first and second law formulation of all systems in the universe. At 23, we have Carl Gauss, a last person to know everything, greatest mathematician ever, whose IQ is ranked by John Platt as having been 190. 
He is considered by Laplace to have been the greatest mathematician in the world. Maxwell described him as having a powerful intellect. He gets a downgrade for having a religious fallout at the age of 60 and grappling with issues such as how religious matters such as ethics, destiny, human future, etc. are outside the province of science. Nevertheless, Gauss is one of the biggest names in electrical engineering. Capping off our category of 190 IQs is Vilfredo Pareto, who is, is currently ranked as number three social Newton. His four-volume treatise on general sociology has been characterized as the Principia of social sciences, which is viewed by some to bring about a revolution in the social methodology. He started with the principles of Newtonian celestial mechanics, chemistry, and physics to formulate the view that society is defined as a social organism, defined as a spinning pyramid, and in his, one of his more famous examples described the circulation of elites such that the poor people, which he defined as molecules, are at the bottom, or start out at the bottom of the pyramid. But as time goes on, more agitated poor molecules circulate the top of the pyramid and become richer. And over time they fall back again into the lower social structure. At 21, moving into the big leagues of the IQ 195 plus range, we have American historian Henry Adams, who, starting at the age of 21, in search of a systematic conception of it all, went on to pen a nine-volume set on the history of the United States during the Jefferson administration for the sole purpose of determining to himself that cause and effect exists in the human sphere of action and reaction in the social context. He is famously known for his the Education of Henry Adams, which is ranked as the greatest American nonfiction book of the 20th century. He is known among geniuses as the second ranked social Newton, historically speaking. He spent the last 10 years of his existence studying the works of Willard Gibbs and trying to formulate a thermodynamic theory of sociology. He states, I would travel a few thousand million miles to discuss with William Thompson the thermodynamics of a socialist society. At the age of 70, in 1908, he famously said in a letter to Charles Gaskell, his lifelong intellectual comrade, that no one shall persuade me that I'm not a phase. The phase in question here is the equilibrium state defined by Gibbs free energy such as was discussed by Schrodinger in his note to chapter 6 statement that shall he had been catering to a hard science audience would have turned the discussion to free energy. At number 20 we have Robert Hooke famously known as the man who knew too much. He is the inventor of a number of things, such as the Boyle pneumatical engine, the hook spring measure of tensile strength, and he's a promulgator of the wave theory of light. When Newton famously said that he stood on the shoulders of giants, he referred to the shoulders of Hook and Descartes. At 19 we have Nikola Tesla who is oft compared to Thomas Edison albeit with a peculiar upgrade to his mind. He is one of the first promoters of the defunct theory of life stating that life does not exist only 
movement and action and reaction. He is famously known for the invention of the alternating current motor. At number 18 we have Voltaire who had his hands in a very large number of intellectual cookie jars. Not only did he work with Emily Chatelet in consolidating the physics work of Newton with Leibniz, but he also published high-ranking literature works and engaged in a number of religion, mythology, and materialism debates in the 18th century. He was the person when Gene Sales was imprisoned for his philosophy of moral nature who went to Sales' jail cell and offered something akin to a hundred thousand dollars for his release. At number 17 we have Leonard Euler. His reciprocity relationship is the mathematical proof behind state functions, particularly entropy or the second law of thermodynamics and energy. It has been famously said that if Gauss is the prince of mathematics, then Euler is its king. He is the highest ranked mathematician by IQ. At 16 we have Ludwig Boltzmann, the famous physicist who formulated the statistical mechanics view of thermodynamics, as shown on his tombstone that the entropy is proportional to the logarithm of the var Scheinle kite or multiplicity of the states of location of the atoms of the system in question. At 15 we have Pierre Laplace, famously known for having formulated the mechanics of the universe in a series of three volumes with which he donated or gave to French President Napoleon during which time he was queried by Napoleon and asked where is God in the framework of this new celestial mechanics to which he famously re replied I had no need of that hypothesis. At 14 we have Gottfried Leibniz known for being the co-founder of differential equations. He invented the integral sign shown here in 1675. He was one of the curators of dynamics via his formulation of vis viva and vis mortua. He once told the Queen of Persia that in mathematics there was all previous history from the beginning of the world and then there was Newton. At 13 we have Rene Descartes. He has a ranker greatest mind position of 35, but his name is so large in genius circles that it is difficult to rank him anywhere but in the top 15. He is known in mathematics for the Cartesian coordinate system. He is better known in philosophy for a large number of things such as the motto that I think therefore I am which is his way to prove that he is not an automaton. He is one of the shoulder geniuses as mentioned that Newton stood on to see farther and his dualism view that the soul exists and that it resides in the pineal gland is one of the near three century long impediments to the acceptance of physical chemical monism and that the soul doesn't exist but the principles that underlie the rules of right and wrong in the context of the movement dynamics of the universe do exist and are explained via the models of natural and unnatural as defined by chemical thermodynamics. 
such as was worked on by Wilhelm Oswald, as discussed previously. At number 12, we have Gilbert Lewis, generally known for the Lewis dot structure of atoms, where he uses a dot to represent the number of electrons around each atom, a technique he developed at MIT in 1902. He is more famously known in genius circles for having published his book on thermodynamics wherein he consolidated or rather translated Willard Gibbs on the equilibrium of heterogeneous substances into a presentation that could be read by the average American chemist. His On the Free Energy of Chemical Substances is considered the most cited thermodynamics book of all time and the precursor to the modern formulation of Gibbs free energy. At number 11 we have Galileo Galilei, rank of greatest mind, position point four, he is a dual scientific revolutions genius. He is a name that goes without question in that his work on the measurement of the stars and the physics of falling bodies precursored both Newton and the later work of Einstein. At number 10 we have Aristotle. He's the biggest name in all of Greek philosophy. He worked on nearly every single problem such as the blue sky problem. His teacher was Plato and he taught Alexander the Great. In short, he unified what's called the Egyptian cosmos conception of things with the Greek philosophy to formulate the Aristotelian view of things. At number nine we have Hermann Helmholtz, who as discussed is the last of the last universal geniuses according to Google Books consensus. He was not only a physician that worked on hearing the eye, but also one of the founders of the first law of thermodynamics, and he was the first to formulate the thermodynamic theory of affinity, which means that the measure of the forces of chemical reactions is determined not by the heat released or absorbed in the reaction, aka the heat theory of affinity, but rather by the measure of the free energy change of reactions, which he published in 1882. At number eight, we're moving into the IQ 200 plus range with the person of Thomas Young, who is known as the last man who knew everything. He was a physician and physicist known for a coining the modern term energy specifically as being equal to one-half mv squared he is the inventor of the double slits light experiment he is a co-translator of the rosetta stone with gene champlain which allowed for the decipherment of all modern religions back into the original egyptian mythology hieroglyphics and he also did battle with Lagrange in mathematics. In one of his personal notes he says, scientific investigations are a sort of warfare carried on in the closet or on the couch against one's contemporaries and predecessors. I have often gained a single victory when I have been half asleep, but more frequently found on being thoroughly awake that the enemy had still the advantage of me when I thought I had him fast in a corner. And all of this, you see, keeps one alive. At number seven, we come to the person of Leonardo da Vinci, who is colloquially known as the greatest mind ever. He has a Cox Buzan IQ of 200, which means that he is independently ranked over time as having a stable IQ of 200, something that will likely not change for centuries or millennia to come. 
he is the person who is pretty much good at everything. Not only was he an artist and a sculptor known for the Mona Lisa, but he published theory on animal heat, art, engineering, warfare technology, flight. He famously was said to have used a sleep formula to accomplish all of this, where he only slept no more than four hours at a time. So to optimize his intellectual output, he famously used mirror writing to keep his ideas secret from everyone. He gets an upgrade above Galileo for supposedly doing a pumpkin growing variant of Johann Helmont's later and more famous willow growing experiment, wherein he determined the measurement of the chemical composition of the pumpkin before and after combustion and growth. Among other things, da Vinci is the inventor of the contact lens, the helicopter, and in religion and mythology, he debunked biblical flood myth based on the evidence that fossils are such a great distance from their original source that there is no way that a flood could have actuated such a movement. At number six, moving into the IQ 205 plus range is German physicist Rudolf Clausius, who from 1850 to 1865, building on the work of William Thompson and Sadi Carnot, published his Mechanical Theory of Heat, wherein he overthrew Lavoisier's Caloric Theory of Heat and in his place substituted, based on Euler's reciprocity relationship, the entropy state function model of heat and in turn the first law of thermodynamics which states that the energy of the universe is conserved and the second law of thermodynamics which states that the entropy of the universe or rather in its original formulation the integral of the heat going into or out of a system divided by the absolute temperature of the system in one heat cycle is equal to the negative value of n which is the equivalence value of all uncompensated transformations, meaning that in the context of the universe, the entropy or measure of the value of heat transforming into work and work transforming into heat inside of systems always increases until the system reaches equilibrium, which is not to say that the system moves to a state of maximum disorder as is commonly known in an ignorant sense in mass culture, but rather that the measure of the transformation has ceased, and this is at a maximum positive value. Suffice it to say that Clausius's ranking at position point six is based on the fact that if anyone wants to publish any or derive any theory about any subject in the context of the grand scheme of things, they have to go through Clausius. At number five, we have a relatively unknown genius, colloquially speaking, but the king of geniuses, among other geniuses. Einstein once famously said that Gibbs is the greatest mind in American history, and this statement stands correct at the present date. He was the first American to get a PhD in engineering. He is known for the Gibbs free energy formulation of the first and second law of thermodynamics. When we discussed earlier about Henry Adams saying at the age of 70 that no one will convince me that he is not a phase, he is referring to the, a point on the three dimensional surface of the energy, the entropy, and the volume of a social system mapped three-dimensionally and his state of existence being defined as a phase or state on this surface for example the slope shown here the following statement suffices to exemplify the genus of Gibbs according to Albert Nock in this last century or generation this country produced one of the most eminent men of science in the whole world. His name was quite unknown among us while he lived and is still unknown. Yet I may say 
without too ex great exaggeration than when I heard it mentioned in a professional assembly in the Netherlands two years ago. Everybody got down on their table and touched their foreheads to the floor. His name was Joshua Willard Gibbs. At number four we have James Maxwell who formulated the equations for the phenomenon of the electromagnetic nature of light. As mentioned, when Boltzmann read these equations, he said, Was it a God that wrote these signs, revealing the hidden and mysterious forces of nature around me, which fill my heart with quiet joy? Maxwell of note was the one intellectual comrade of Willard Gibbs. Gibbs famously sent his 1876 paper on the equilibrium of heterogeneous substances to all the scientists in the world, numbering over 200, and it was Maxwell who was the only one who understood Gibbs' works. At number three we have Albert Einstein, famous for his study of the nature of time which resulted in the theory of relativity and that large masses cause space and time to morph such that neither space nor time exists but space-time together is a quantity that exists and it is the morphing around large masses that causes the force of gravity, such as the force that causes the Earth to rotate around the Sun like a ball falling into a vat, or the Moon rotating around the Earth falling into an indentation. At number two we have Isaac Newton, famous for his solution to the three laws of motion, that is the law of inertia, that force equals mass times acceleration, and that for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction, and for his formulation of the universal force of gravitation, or inverse square relationship between force of a body and the distance between the bodies and their masses, which, as mentioned, he said he derived by standing on the shoulders of Hooke, who had developed an early formulation of this, and Descartes, who had formulated some of the earlier mathematical work of this. He is also known for his last and final publication called Query 31, where he attempts to formulate the physics of chemical reactions. He states, is it not for a want of attractive virtue between the parts of water and oil, of quicksilver and antimony, of lead and iron, that these substances do not mix. In other words, when you put this paired chemical in contact with this paired chemical, no reaction will occur. He continues, and by a weak attraction that quicksilver and copper mix with difficulty. In other words, if you put this paired chemical entity in contact with this paired chemical entity, one can make a reaction occur, albeit forcibly, or with difficulty, as Newton says. He continues, and from a strong one, that quicksilver and tin, antimony and iron, water and salts mix readily. In other words, in this third grouping, this chemical pair will mix with this chemical pair, or will mix with this chemical pair, or this chemical pair, or with water as a chemical pair, and with salts. In other words, if we put water in contact with salts, a reaction will occur readily or without force. So Newton, in the statement, differentiates three types of chemical contact, and therein launched the science of affinity chemistry, which is the key behind Goethe's 1809 elective affinities, as well as later founded or initiated the science of what became known as physical chemistry. The extrapolation of this logic 
to the human sphere of reactions, as was done by Goethe, as we will discuss, is that this first grouping of chemicals can be classified as stably bonded married couples who, when put into contact with each other, will not mix or no reaction will occur. The middle grouping of contacts shown here will mix with difficulty. That is, they are semi-stable bonded entities that can be made to react, but only forcibly. The third group would be classified as pairs, for example, a daughter bonded to her family at the age of, say, 18 to 25, who is ready to detach and react with another entity, such as a young man bonded to his family at the age of, say, 20 to 27, to form a new couple. He says these will mix readily. At number one, we have German polyintellect Johann Goethe. He's ranked with a Cox Buzan IQ of 213. He has a ranker greatest mind ranking of 24, which means there is a disjunct between his genius and that he is a catch up effect genius. And what modern genius study scholars rank his IQ at. He again similar to Voltaire, had his hands in a large number of intellectual cookie jars, such as being the second-ranked literary master behind Shakespeare, a founder of evolution nearly a century before Darwin, a blue-sky problem theorist, and best-known for taking Newton's query 31, which differentiated the chemical forces between chemical reactants and products, and applying this logic to human reactions. Wherein, for example, in his 1809 novella, he steps through some 36 different chemical reactions occurring in the social sphere, such as, as shown here, when Edward symbolic of calcium, who's married to Charlotte, symbolic of carbon trioxide, or bonded together as gypsum in a weakly married state, is put in contact with the social introductions of Audley, Charlotte's adopted best friend's niece and the captain, who is Edward's pal from earlier days of youth, who is representative of sulfuric acid. The contact brings about through no choice of the will of the four pairs, a double displacement reaction where Edward is forced out of the nature of the free energies or micro forces of the interaction to bond with Audley, and the captain is forced to bond and later proposes in marriage to Charlotte through the course of 36 chapters. All of this brings to fore what is characterized by Heinrich Hein as a new philosophy that overturns everything holy.